Hey everybody, welcome back to the second part of the Qatari 132 scale Spitfire Mark 1 build. Uh, last time in part 1 I built all the main cockpit sub-assemblies, did a dry test fit into the uh, fuselage and that went without a hitch. So this week I've gone ahead uh, in part 2 and done the painting of the cockpit, done some detail work on it as well and I've finally fitted it into the fuselage. The fuselage is assembled. And I have to say that the uh, fantastic fit of the kit that uh, we were looking at in part one has continued. This uh, assembly has gone together uh, without a hitch. So I'll bring you over to the bench and I think you'll be as impressed as I have been this week with the fit and the quality of this kit. Okay, so we're going to make a start this week by taking a look at the colour chart in page 2 of the Qatari instructions. Now, there's obviously the names of the colours that we're going to be using and the references that we'll see appearing in the instruction sheet. Tamiya give us the paints available in the Tamiya and Humbrol ranges and also the BS or FS colours uh, equivalents in case you've got uh, a different preference for the sort of paints that you want to use. Uh, although on a subject like this I think most people will have uh, no difficulty in selecting uh, the colours that they're going to be using if they want to use a different range. The one interesting thing here is uh, Qatari's call out for what they describe as supermarine interior green. Uh, which the call out is a mixture of XF71 cockpit green which is actually a Japanese colour in the Tamiya range uh, and a mixture of that with uh, bright green which is this X28 part green it's called uh, and that's a two to one mix so what that will do is give us a much greener shade for the cockpit It'll be interesting to see when I mix that up exactly what it looks like uh, and also this uh, colour here which is XF76 for some components in the cockpit which is a little pale I think for RAF interior green so uh, I'm not sure about that, I'm not convinced uh, how that will look I might substitute that for just pure XF71 which you can see the difference there in the two shades so the first job I've got is to mix up this uh, supermarine interior green, I'll get a fresh jar and then we'll come back and see what uh, that looks like against the base colours. Okay, so I've mixed up the uh, suggested blend of XF71 and X28 for what Qataria call in Supermarine Interior Green. And just comparing that with the base XF71, the cockpit green, you can see the difference between the two. This is much more pea coloured, uh, whereas the base XF71 looks a bit greyer. So that's going to make for an interesting uh, combination in the cockpit. And I think it'll spark off a lot of debate. I've never heard of uh, Supermarine Interior Green being different to what we normally assume is RAF Interior Green. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. I'm uh, following to the letter the uh, Qatari paint callouts uh, and to a large extent that's because I trust their research. Uh, they're pretty renowned uh, for researching their subjects and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that looks in comparison to the usual shades of cockpit green that most of us as modelers are used to. Uh, just a word about mixing this, uh, I simply uh, just marked up the label into thirds here uh, to give us the two to one uh, ratio. It's close enough uh, to do it like that. You could measure it with a pipette if you wanted to, but uh, in my opinion, after weathering and shading and so on, uh, that's a close enough approximation. So that's what most of the cockpit on our Spitfire is going to look like. Before I do any painting on the interior, I just want to fit the radio access hatch. That's so that uh, 
the finish will match up on the inside even though it's probably going to be virtually impossible to see this. So this is Mr. Surfacer 1500 Black. Okay, so that's the uh, black base coat on. I'll uh, put some of the Supermarine green in and uh, I'll be interested to see what that looks like uh, on the airframe. Okay, so I've masked off the rear of this cockpit floor because eventually that will be painted in an aluminium colour. So we've got the uh, Qatari mix for the Supermarine green in the airbrush. This is a Harder and Steenbeck uh, Infinity and it's got a 0.2mm nozzle in it. Uh, this just gives you a little bit uh, more control, finer control on the airbrush. The compressor is set to around about 12, 13 psi, something like that. It might sound louder on the audio. I know a couple of people have commented that when I do film my airbrushing, which isn't often, uh, the compressor sounds a bit loud and that's just because the uh, microphone tends to pick up the hiss from the airbrush a little bit. So let's give this colour a try. This is a pretty thin paint mixture, it's at least 50% thinners. So the effect I'm going for here is to make sure that the uh, surfaces facing upwards are getting a reasonable coating of the green, uh, but the vertical surfaces in the detail is getting less paint, less green. So it creates automatic shadows and as I said it's just a start to the weathering process. Some people uh, also add white to the centre of the panels, but I don't bother with that, I think the grey is enough. So at this stage the uh, effect is just a bit exaggerated or at least it is for me so what I want to do is uh, draw the airbrush back a little bit and just blend that uh, green colour into the black a bit more
So uh, next up, uh, I'll do these parts, which Katari call out to be painted actually in XF76. Uh, so uh, an approximation for British interior green. Uh, this is XF76. This is XF71 that I think is nearer to British interior green, perhaps not grey enough. Uh, but certainly this one looks a bit light. I'm going to use this for the highlighting stage uh, on the interior. But I think this one is a bit more suited. I might just lighten it a little bit with the XF76 uh, just to see how it goes. But uh, let's just experiment with that and see how much contrast there is with this first green colour that I've applied. Okay, so uh, I've done that and actually comparing the two greens, there's very little difference between them. Uh, I think the original colour, which is uh, the so-called uh, supermarine green, uh, is a bit brighter, certainly in the centres of these panels. Certainly to the eye, there is a very slight difference, but I'm not sure it's worth going to the lengths of differentiating between them. I think you'd easily get away with one interior green colour. And what I actually used in the end here was a mixture of the XF76, which is what Katari call out for these parts, and darkened it a little bit with XF71. So it's somewhere in between 71 and 76, about 50-50 mix. So the next step with these is to give them a highlight, and for that I'm going to use the XF76, which is the lighter of the greens. And hopefully that will give us the highlights uh, in addition to the uh, low lights, I suppose you can say, where I've done the black undercoating. So we'll get uh, at least a range of three or four different shades of green there just to add interest to the cockpit. So we're moving on to the dry brushing now, and my old dry brush has given up I've had it for probably three or four years now and uh, it's no longer suitable so I've invested in a new set of dry brushes these from uh, Army Painter uh, they're not too expensive you can get some really expensive uh, dry brushes but uh, I just wanted to try these out see what they were like so let's see uh, what sort of effect we can get with them I'll start off on a pretty obscure part of the fuselage just so that I get my uh, eye in, if you like. If you haven't done dry brushing before, it's a really a nice technique. It really does bring out a lot of the detail. And the trick with it, as I say, if you've not done it before, is to take it very gently. It's very easy to overdo it and get the lighter shade where you don't want it. So uh, just gradually work the brush into the detail. Just skip it over the top of these ribs. And the effect I prefer is uh, very subtle. There's very little paint on the brush and it actually brings out detail on these Katari parts that I didn't even realise were there. It's not until you do this stage that uh, they really start to pop. Actually some of this I don't need to do because it's going to be painted uh, later on in aluminium so uh, you really just need it from uh, this position forward There's a point in this process where you sometimes think you're not doing anything because the effect is very subtle. But if you just keep on working at it, gradually the detail starts to emerge. So 
if you're careful about it you can manage to get the tiny little rivets on the panels to pop out so if you can see here on this close-up how the uh, rivet detail is showing through so I'll carry on with the other parts it's the same process just work nice and gently methodically around the detail and uh, we'll come back when it's time to do the next stage okay I've masked off all the parts now ready for the aluminium areas and the only thing to take care of here is to make sure that you get the correct frame position for the masking it sounds obvious but uh, you just need to think twice about it sometimes so for this I'm going to be using Tamiya's lacquer paint gloss aluminium it's LP70 I think and uh, once I've done that we'll come back get them unmasked ready for the next step so that's all done um, the Tamiya gloss aluminium is my favorite finish for this sort of uh, application it dries really smooth and uh, has a slight sheen to it as you can see and uh, you can put uh, enamel washes over that straight away you don't need to gloss it and we'll uh, dirty that up a little bit later on picking out a few details on these frames this is a Tamiya lacquer matte black LP3 and it's uh, really nice for brush painting okay so um, I just want to apply a coat of gloss varnish to the green areas because uh, there are a number of decals to fit to these the side walls and of course the instrument panels to do as well so I'm going to be using some Tamiya lacquer uh, gloss varnish for that uh, leave it overnight then uh, we can get the decals on so these are the armor plates and I just want to paint the uh, yellow circles on them or dots uh, they denoted armour plate material in the RAF. Uh, Qatari supply some decals for these but I'm going to paint them on. I think it will give a better finish to the piece. So I've scaled off the Qatari decals which tell me that the dots were 7mm in scale. So I'm going to be using these uh, ready made circle templates. There are obviously uh, two different ways of doing this. You could either uh, paint the yellow first, just put one of these dots on and then uh, put the green around it. I prefer doing it this way because you can uh, dry brush uh, the green before applying the yellow dot. So obviously this is the mask that we need but I'll use the dot to give me an accurate position for the uh, masking template and uh, remove the circle we can use that again the one on the head arm is a bit smaller so I'm going to go for uh, a 6.2 millimeter these sheets go all the way down to one millimeter and up to 7.6 so they're very useful so uh, I'll get over get these yellow dots on this is just uh, Tamiya XF3 flat yellow we can get the masking off I 
I should really have fitted this panel earlier on before I uh, applied the green. And Katari make this a separate panel because it accommodates slightly different versions. So uh, there we are, caught up with myself there. So now I'm going to make a start with the decals. These um, just say printed in Italy. I'm probably it's fairly likely that they're made by Cartograph. I'm not sure about that, but it is possible. They're certainly uh, very nice, but as you can see, there's an awful lot of stencil uh, and placard detail to add to these uh, parts that I've just been working on. So I'll just apply the first uh, few on camera and then uh, I'll just get on and do the rest off. Uh, so I'll let you know how they apply. Normally, if they are cartograph, they should be okay with some microset. I'll try some sol if needed on one of the more obscure decals just in case it uh, creases it. Uh, but generally, as I said, they go on all right uh, with uh, the set only. That's if they are cartograph, of course. Somebody might know for sure one way or another. These are very thin decals. They look uh, slightly thicker on the sheet, but uh, I'm going to have to be careful with them. You don't want to tear these. I think there's an error with this one, uh, 115. Uh, the instructions direct us to fit it to this uh, box structure here, but uh, it's not wide enough to accommodate it. And I think it goes down here. So I'm going to take a chance and fit that onto the panel below. If I hadn't have had that uh, in the water, I'd have gone away and checked that. So uh, we'll see. No doubt someone will correct me if it's wrong. I'm going to try a little bit of microsol on this decal here. It just needs to settle into the detail a little bit. And as ever with Microsalt, once you've got it on, leave it alone. Another tip with these decals is just to mark off when you've applied them. You can see there's such a lot that it would be easy to miss uh, the placement on some of these. Some of these are, well, ridiculously small, I suppose. But uh, it's just one of those things when you're doing things like this, um, that it's the overall effect rather than just the individual uh, decal. Some of these are just so small that they float around in the microsets, hard to get them into position. How on earth anybody produces decals that size is uh, beyond me, really. I've just noticed that uh, this panel here at the front, in front of the uh, instrument panel, should be in the aluminium colour. So it's not too late to fix that. Uh, but that's the decals fitted onto the uh, port sidewall. And the thing with them is that they don't need a lot of uh, microsol. I've just used a little bit on this one here because it needs to settle into the detail. Uh, but apart from that, they go down fine with microset. Okay, so I'm going to carry on with the rest of the decals uh, elsewhere in the cockpit. And uh, then these parts will get a very uh, light wash just to... Uh, accentuate the details even more and uh, then that should uh, be ready for a mat coat and assembly after that 
So this uh, decal here on the oxygen bottle didn't fit very well in my case so I just cut it in half and fitted it either side of the band. It's designed to uh, go in one piece around the band. And it brings back memories of my time as an engineer in the Air Force. It uh, reads, use no oil or grease, they cause explosions. Uh, and that's a piece of information that's never left me. I remember uh, the most horrendous training videos showing you what the consequences uh, could be of handling liquid oxygen around uh, dirty overalls or tools. Uh, and it's a lesson that I've never forgotten. Uh, even though uh, I've no cause these days to uh, use liquid oxygen. But I can assure you, if I did, I'd be very careful. That's all the uh, decals fitted now. And there are an awful, I lost count of how many there are, but uh, it's taken about five or six hours to get all those on. Uh, so uh, it's a significant part of the cockpit build. But uh, they do make a lot of difference. It's the uh, starboard sidewall with the oxygen bottle that you saw earlier on. The uh, port sidewall with the throttle quadrant. That's got to be painted yet, the handle for that. We've got some placards here as well. Same here on the port. A couple of other bits and pieces have uh, had decals on. But the main work is in the instrument panel. This has got to be matte coated and the instrument face is picked out uh, with some gloss varnish. But uh, you can see there the number of separate decals there are to uh, get that instrument panel sorted out. The uh, one enhancement I've made to this uh, is to add these brass wires uh, which are quite distinctive actually on this bulkhead. They go through this lightning hole here and they look uh, much better uh, in brass than they do uh, painted. I'll give these uh, sidewalls, the green areas of the sidewalls, a wash uh, with a bit of uh, panel liner, tell me a panel liner. But I'm not going to go overboard with it, I don't want to make these over dirty. This is Tamiya's uh, dark brown wash and it goes nicely on green painted surfaces. I think black's a little bit harsh. So I'm just using this to suggest a little bit of grime in the recesses of the cockpit floor. I think this will be uh, fairly difficult to pick out on the camera. The brown also works well on the aluminium areas. This is pretty uh, selective. I don't like to put wash all over the uh, painted surface. just using enough to run right the way into the detail but uh, no more than that and it just accentuates the uh, black pre-shading that we did this panel line uh, accent colour the Tamiya stuff uh, you've got to give it a good shake every now and again just to make sure that the pigments mixed in properly they do tend to settle quite a bit and obviously they won't have any effect if you just put in thinners on basically and these are an enamel uh, wash so they're easily cleaned up with some mineral spirits if you get them in the wrong position. Uh, 
if you get the wash somewhere where you don't want it it's easy enough just to uh, dry the Tamiya brush out and uh, use it to pick up the excess wash. Okay, so that's uh, all the panel liner done, as much as I want to. And uh, I'm going to leave that overnight to dry. Uh, and then I'll come back tomorrow, give it a coat of matte varnish. And all these parts will then be ready for assembly. So I'm just thinking through the build sequence now. And uh, the main items that I've got to finish before I can install the cockpit uh, is to uh, finish the seat off by making the belts and also to do the rigging uh, and I've been thinking about uh, how I go about this and I think the best sequence will be to uh, mat coat all the glossed areas where I've been applying the decals I've already done these two then what that will uh, enable me to do is to assemble one of the side walls onto the floor and that will make sure that I get the frame set in the correct position so that I can do the rigging. And then the last thing I'll do is to finish off the seat, which is this, uh, attach it to this frame here, I think it's frame 11. And then I'll fit the uh, shoulder harness because the shoulder harness goes through the armour plate on the headrest uh, and through to an attachment point on the base of the radio mast. And for that reason I'm just going to have to have the frames installed so I make sure that the uh, top of the shoulder belt is cut to the correct length. So I think that's going to work. I just need to flat coat this uh, port sidewall. You'll notice the difference in uh, colour now that this uh, side wall has been flat coated and that's because the gloss varnish tends to saturate the colours a little bit and darken them. So we're back to uh, the uh, more or less the base coat that I put on and it also uh, restores all the uh, dry brushing, the lighter dry brushing that I did earlier on in the video. You'll notice here that I've put some paper underneath the masking tape and that's because I've got a decal underneath and I don't want the masking tape to tear that off. So that just protects the decals. It's always a danger uh, when you're applying masking tape over parts that have got decals on them. Uh, but that's just a bit of insurance to make sure that you don't do any damage. I've got a silver pencil here. These are just artist pencils. I know you can get ones designed for modelling by uh, companies like AK. I have actually got some AK weathering pencils on order, but they've not arrived yet. So I'll have to give them an outing uh, when we come to uh, do the weathering on the airframe. Just going back to the decals for a minute, something to be aware of, be careful of, uh, is that Qatari in the placement guide don't give us uh, the image of the decal. It's just a white silhouette. And for that reason, it's easy to get these upside down. Uh, so, for example, on this one, I managed to uh, position this upside down. And it wasn't until I took a close-up photograph that I realised it was. Uh, but fortunately, I managed to very gently lift it with some water and reposition it with some uh, decal adhesive, which is this. Now, it possibly wouldn't have been noticeable. But when you look at these under a strong magnification, they are absolutely legible. Uh, so for example this one is the uh, mixture uh, rich and lean it says on it. So uh, I wanted to get it right and fortunately I got away with it by being able to reposition it. Just adding some gloss clear to the instruments now.
Okay, I think we're all done. So uh, let's start to do some assembly now. And a good reference point for getting everything lined up is to fit the starboard side wall. As we've seen before uh, in part one on the test fit that goes and clicks in. It's a really nice fit. There are some parts to assemble onto the side wall. This is the undercarriage lever. Uh, just adding a little wash to that just to accentuate the detail. There's some uh, rigging to go on the front end of this undercarriage lever but it goes through the instrument panel so I just want to get that uh, into position first. For all the rigging I'm using this which is uh, not 0.2 millimeter nickel rod. Uh, Qatari call out 0.15 millimeters so this is a bit thick but it's the nearest I've got so uh, that's what I'm going to be using Trim these ends off a little bit when they're dry. Okay, next we've got the rudder pedals. If you saw part one, I was debating about the offset of these rudder pedals, uh, but it turns out that. Uh, Qatari have designed them like that because the rudder is offset. Goodness me, that's an awkward fit. Those heel boards are a pretty tight fit in there. And I was just trying to be careful not to dislodge the uh, control wires that I just put in. Okay, control column next. Next, this is the elevator crank. And uh, the elevator control rod there. Frame 11 next. Let's put the head armour on first. Just put one or two scuffs on that. The headrest. Now, in order to uh, rig the elevator and rudder controls, I need to put these rear frames in position. 
uh, because the control rods go through these uh, frames and they're actually quite difficult to get seated down I mentioned earlier on I think in the building part one that uh, the kit was probably likely to have fairly uh, tight tolerances for fit Just putting in the first of the control lines now. This is for the rudder. So there are two of these on each side. Just putting a little hook on that one. And once you've got them hooked up at the front, we'll uh, just fix them at the rear on this plate. You just need to be careful the uh, run of these cables. This particular one goes through uh, frame 11 through a little hole in frame 11. Next we'll do the elevator controls. There are four of these to fit on again. With these I'm just going to put a little hook on the end. This is the last one. That's all the rigging done. Obviously all these uh, cables need to be tied off and uh, cut shorter. Uh, but I just want to make sure that everything, all the CA is completely set before I do that. With all uh, those cables fitted and the port sidewall completed, I can just fit that together now. And what we're looking for here is to make sure that all the frames are in the correct position and that everything interlocks properly. And here I will just add a little bit of glue onto the fuel tank panel here. Just pinch that together temporarily. So 
the last couple of details on the upper side walls. Okay, so that's all done. The last thing to do now is get the seat ready. The armour plate in first. And then we'll have to make the belts up. The armour plate just clips in. Just uh, add a few little chips and scratches to the top edge so now uh, time to make the belts up and I mentioned earlier on uh, in the video that I was going to be using some HGW belts one nice thing about these HGW belts is uh, that the on a Sutton harness we've got these little holes in the belt and HGW provide a photo etch piece that goes behind that and just gives the impression of a steel uh, rivet in there. It's just a really uh, nice detail on those. Now one thing interesting here is that uh, Qatari, if you remember, provided a uh, seat with the belts on and one without. I've obviously used the one without. But the sides still have the remnants of the belt moulding on them. Now you could remove those, but I decided that the uh, HGW belts would cover those up. So uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'll fit them at this stage. Leave that to set. We'll arrange the belts on the seat in a moment once we get both on. So with the lap belts in, we can now put the seat into the cockpit. So with the seat in place, I can now measure up for the shoulder harness, make that up and uh, get it fitted. Okay, we'll do the uh, shoulder belts now on camera. I did the lap belts off just for a bit of speed, get ahead of myself. So these are microfiber. These are obviously more complicated than the lap belts, which is why I saved them uh, to do now. Now the thing with these is that um, they're actually on a backing paper so you've got to remove them from the backing paper first before you use them. If you don't do that they're too thick uh, to go through the buckles. And the other thing that's useful with them is just to scrunch them up a little bit otherwise they just lie a little bit flat. So I'll just give them a bit of a twist round, roll them up, 
looks a bit harsh, but it does make a difference to them. One little trick with these HGW belts is to thread the buckles on whilst the uh, buckle is still on the fret. And then once you've done that you can carefully Cut the buckle and there it is on the belt. So here I'm just checking the position of the shoulder belt into the cockpit. Now here this section is meant to thread through these two buckles at the same time as the main belt. But in practice that's just far too difficult to do. So what I do is just uh, glue this behind the main belt. And it just gives the same impression. One slight issue with these belts sometimes is because they're only printed on one side. And when you've got a piece like this that you have to turn over. You can sometimes see a little bit of the white. In which case you just need to uh, touch them up with some Tamiya buff. Next we've got some, uh, these are adjusting straps I think. This is medium CA by the way, it uh, really works pretty well. There's no doubt that these are awkward to put together, but I think they're worth it. The uh, moulding in the Katari kit wasn't bad for the moulded in seat belts. And I think I prefer those to photo etch. I don't really like uh, photo etch steel or brass uh, belts in 32 scale kits. These are the uh, fastening clips, or the locking clip. The locking toggle, if you like, is in two parts. We've got a ring that goes on first. And then this pin folds in half. Okay, that's the uh, shoulder belts, and now we've got the uh, slightly tricky task of fitting it onto the seat. So this is the really nerve-wracking part of putting belts on a freshly painted seat. That's the uh, seat end done. We just need to attach the uh, back part of the belt, this strap here, which attaches via a buckle and a bungee onto the uh, base of the radio mast, which is here. So 
So again, I've got some of our uh, 0.2 millimeter nickel wire. So uh, I'm really happy with that. I'm uh, going to get it into the fuselage now. That's the safest place for it. Okay, so let's get this cockpit fitted and the fuselage halves joined up. I uh, mustn't forget the prop shaft because we'll uh, all want to play with the propeller when it's uh, installed. Okay, I think that's in. We're all good. Uh, that was a lot of work this week on that cockpit, and I think that's probably the majority of the model. So uh, it doesn't look much at the moment, but uh, we're really well on with this kit now. Okay, so uh, the day after now, and I've removed the tape on the fuselage assembly, and all the joints are nice and tight. That's all good. Uh, the only cleanup I think we're going to have to do is on the rear underside uh, where we've got the job of preserving all the raised rivets on the uh, kit. Uh, but the rest of the uh, fuselage will be completed with a single piece spine. Uh, we've got the fuel tank cover to fit and obviously the cowlings. But uh, knowing how the model's gone together so far and the fantastic fit on this, I've no concerns that they'll uh, cause us any trouble. So in the next episode, uh, part three, I'm going to finish the airframe, obviously the wings, tailplane and those uh, inserts and panels that I've just talked about. And at that stage, we should be uh, getting ready to get the whole airframe primed and start to do some painting. So that next episode will be coming up uh, next Friday as a premiere. Uh, and I hope that uh, those of you that are building the kit, and I know that a few of you are, uh, that you're enjoying it as much as uh, I am. So enjoy your modelling and uh, hopefully I'll see you next time for the next episode. Bye for now.